All right, this picture right here represents uh, an event in uh, Louis Armstrong's career. It's his, um, what you would call his ascent to Damascus. In uh, 19, I think it's 1911, 1912, New Year's Eve, he was arrested by the New Orleans uh, juvenile court system, uh, which we had one of the first juvenile court systems in the country. Um, uh, he was arrested at the corner of Perdido and Rampart Street for shooting a gun off. And in his uh, uh, autobiography, it's called My Life in New Orleans, he talks about his friends. When, he, he, the, when the, the cops got him, his friends all ran off. So that's what this represents. It's his sort of his betrayal by his friends, right? And he's being, he's being taken into custody. And when he did, he was sent to the Waves home, um, uh, which actually still existed as, as a building when I was a young man. Uh, it was um, off of Canal Boulevard near City Park Avenue. And, um, he was, uh, the, the Waves home was, uh, was uh, designed around a, a band. In other words, if you, if you were sent to this home, you learned to play an instrument and you were put in the band, the Waves home band, Color Waves home band. And so he was given a cornet. So that's why I say this is his ascent to Damascus. This is the event, climactic in his life, that changed his life completely. Now I have other, I've done other pictures. Um, I have one other painting I did, it's called Louis Armstrong of Zulu, which is a, a, not in the show, but it's a, at the Intercontinental Hotel, and it depicts him as the King of Zulu back in 1949. And then I have another picture that I did with Armstrong in it called um, uh, Louis Armstrong playing on the SS Capitol in 1919 with the Fate Marable Band. That was his first real, uh, well, he played with King Oliver's group, uh, but he also played on the, uh, for the Streckfuss line uh, on, with Fate Marable. Fate Marable was the leader of the band uh, on the Capitol, which is a dance boat that sailed out of New Orleans. And um, so I have three, three paintings about Armstrong under my belt. And uh, uh, the, that picture of Armstrong that I did of uh, Fate Marable, with the Fate Marable bands at the uh, Hilton, on the third floor breezeway to the left of the Versailles room. <laughs> now we go in here. Um, you might wonder why there's a painting of, uh, this is called Hadrian and his architect Apollodorus of Damascus examining a model of the Pantheon. Now wh what is this doing in a show about celebrating the 200th anniversary of Louisiana history, I mean of the state of Louisiana? Well, one thing is, is that there's, a, uh, uh, there's a, a book that was published by the University of Louisiana by a, 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 a historian here, a man named Carl Richard, or Richard Richard probably, I've never met the man, but it's called Why We're All Romans. And it's, a, it's a, an overview of the influence of Roman culture on, uh, 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 in, in the United States and uh, in the pr present time. And um, uh, I did this as a, this is a commission. I did this for, for an architect in New Orleans, a man named Ron Blitch, and, uh, who studied in Rome, incidentally, studied architecture in, in, in Rome. And uh, he's right here. He's impersonating uh, the uh, architect Apollodorus of Damascus. And here's the Emperor Hadrian right here. And they're examining, they're examining a model of the Pantheon. Uh, the Romans built from models. They didn't build so much from drawings as from models because classical architecture is very regular. And so uh, you could make certain assumptions about the detailing. Uh, and it didn't, they, 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 the architecture had a, a sort of a pattern to it that uh, was easily explained by just putting a model of the building that they were going to be constructing. Now, the, the, build, the building itself, the Pantheon, had been constructed uh, by Marcus Agrippa, who was uh, the, emperor, the first emperor of, of Rome, Augustus's uh, sort of right-hand man. And it's, it was dedicated to a, a temple that was dedicated to all the gods, hence the term Pantheon. Hadrian redid it with his uh, architect Apollodorus of Damascus, making it a round temple with a dome structure, a, a domed ceiling. The original, the, the original pantheon was not domed, nor was it circular. But he left, the, the emperor left the original inscription up. It says Marcus Agrippa had this constructed, and, um, which is, shows the, the, the generosity of Hadrian, who's one of the five good emperors, right? Uh, and actually, the, uh, he was, a, uh, he was the, um, the, I, the, the platonic ideal ruler. He was a poet, musician, philosopher, ruler, military man. He was, all, he was uh, the universal type that was, you know, was admired by, uh, by the Greeks. 
And anyway, so what this depicts is the building, the building yard of the Pantheon with the Pantheon in the background. Now, the way I did this from models, I actually built a model of the scaffolding and I built a model of this, uh, not quite in the detail that it's in the painting, but it's uh, you know, uh, enough to, 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 to create the, uh, the, uh, the, the format. Uh, and what I did was put it on what would have been the, the altar in the forecourt of the Pantheon. So here are all the courtiers coming up, admiring the work, you know, and here's, like I say, here's the emperor. And, um, and it's all based on real, this is the, the, um, the baths of, uh, of uh, Nero right over here, it was a, the arcades, you see. I actually, when I go to Rome, I stay in a hotel that's right across the, the, the way from the Pantheon. When you walk out the door, you can see the Pantheon. It's a spectacular view. It's a little cheap hotel, but it's, it has the best architectural view on earth when you walk out the front door. Now these pictures right here, these paintings I did were a, a spec job that I was, uh, a friend of mine was an architect, uh, called me up one day and he says, George, could you come up with some ideas about uh, uh, for uh, an office that I'm doing, a, a, um, a law office has a big lobby and they've got some room uh, maybe in there for some paintings. And so I came up with the idea of maybe doing some paintings of the history of the, uh, of the Roman civil law. You know, Louisiana law is based on civil law, hence that's why it's in this show. And uh, what it depicts, what these paintings depict are the, is the three stages of the Roman law. The Republican period, the two pictures here begin the beginning and end of the, of the, um, of the imperial period, and the end picture here is the dominant period. The, the first picture depicts uh, Cicero defending Caecina. Cicero is uh, the first lawyer of the generation of the first lawyers, where you hired someone to speak for you. Uh, in the magisterial court. And the, the original magisterial court was in the Roman Forum, and the, the, Roman, people, uh, the Roman people were allowed in because the, their, uh, uh, there was a the theory that they were being educated as Romans and that they, if they could see the law at work that would make them better citizens. And um, Cicero actually studied speech uh, with an actor named Paris, who, because uh, Cicero realized that the, uh, um, that in a sense the law, and the Romans realized this through the uh, court of law was a dramatic event. And so in order to defend your uh, position, you had to be eloquent at doing it. In other words, you had to be a great rhetorician, not just in terms of your, your, your education and intelligence, but your ability to speak. And so this represents one of, his, uh, one of um, Cicero's more famous cases uh, where he's defending a landowner named Caecina. Uh, Cicero was very proud of the speech they made in defense of Caecina, who was, being, who was suing uh, 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 the lover of his ex-wife who, left, uh, who, did, who left, his, um, left some property in, uh, in the countryside around Rome to her boyfriend and not to her husband. I think that's what the, 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 in fact, I had a friend of mine that wrote a, wrote a book about the history of the Roman law, which I used to, to, um, to do these whole, the, the whole picture, except this third one, but I'll get to. Um, this picture represents the height of the Roman, the imperial age of, Ro of Roman law, the imperial period. And, um, you know, under the, under the Roman uh, system, uh, the emperor, as established by Augustus, was uh, considered to be like the executive. The Senate would pass laws. The Romans believed that you could actually create a law for, any, for, uh, for reasons, uh, whatever, and that uh, you didn't have to go to the, to the gods or to some pre-existent, um, uh, some pre-existent, um, um, what would you call it, a, a form, a legal form, you could actually create a law. And the Senate was the, was the legislative body that could create laws when they needed to. But what they did, they, see, they would create these laws throughout, throughout time, and then they would be codified. They'd have to be codified so the lawyers could consult them. In other words, it would create a library of the, of the laws that the Senate had passed. And the, the duty, one of the duties of the emperor, besides his military duties, was to codify the law. So the law, uh, the Roman law uh, under Hadrian was, was uh, codified by um, a jurist named Gaius. So this is called Hadrian in the office of Gaius the Jurist. Now, I put the Pantheon in the background because you associate the Pantheon with, with, uh, with Hadrian. And actually, some people think, uh, some historians think he had a hand in designing, not just, you know, Apollodorus of Damascus was the, the architect, but Hadrian was also very talented vis-a-vis -vis architecture himself. And some people think he actually, 
the, the design is based upon his ideas and not Apollodorus of Damascus. In fact, it's an interesting thing about Apollodorus of Damascus is that there was another major project. Um, it was called the Temple of Venus in Rome. It was uh, dedicated to, uh, to the goddess Venus and, the, and who was, uh, um, who was a particular uh, goddess patroness of, of Hadrian, but also uh, the temp Rome was considered to be a deity also. And um, uh, they had a model of the, 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 um, of the edifice, which is kind of, it's a, now it's a ruin, but uh, De Apollodorus of Damascus was looking at it and Hadrian was ex you know, explaining how the, the, each, each, uh, at each end was a, a, a little edicula, a big, I mean a little one, a big edicula where the goddess was seated, Rome, and on the other end was, Ve was Venus. And Apollodorus of Damascus said to Hadrian, he said, Sire, he said, if the goddess stood up, she would bump her head on the ceiling, <laughs> right? And all the courtiers laughed at his little joke. Hadrian didn't laugh and he had him killed. Right? He was a very vain man. So anyway, that's, that's Hadrian for you. And this right here, this is called uh, the assassination of Ulpian. Ulpian was um, a, the last of the Roman jurists. He was appointed to be the head of the Praetorian Guard, which is a, an association of barbarians established by Augustus to be the, the emperor's personal bodyguard. Uh, and um, they, they were Germans. And um, uh, this man was appointed to be the head of it. Now, what he, the Alex Alexander Severus was the emperor, he's a teenage emperor. This is in the, the, uh, the era of the Severans. Um, he appointed essentially what was uh, an intellectual to be, a, the, to be uh, the, the, uh, the boss of a gang of thugs. And one evening they turned on him. Nobody knows why. Uh, there's, no, there's no explanation of why they turned on him, but he tried to flee to the, to the emperor's palace on the, uh, on the uh, Palatine Hill, and they cut his throat, they killed him. But what they did when they killed uh, Ulpian, they killed the last of the Roman jurists. With the death of Ulpian went the entire, was, went the only man who understood by this period, which is the Severans had turned the Roman Empire into a police state. He was the last one that had a total grasp of what the Roman law represented. And what they did was kill him. Now, I got this great idea. This idea is, uh, I was, um, a friend of mine was uh, calling me up one day as a taught uh, law at Tulane, because you know, Tulane teaches civil law. And he says, George, I've got to come see this wonderful uh, teacher from uh, Professor Stein, Peter Stein from Oxford. He comes over every two years. And he reconstructs with the students the magisterial court, the system, the, 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 um, the ritual of the magisterial court. So he said, you should come and watch this. And I went over there and it was a really very nice uh, tutorial about Roman law. Well, I, I, we had uh, Professor Stein and I were talking and I said, I have a problem. I'm doing a series of pictures about the Roman law. And what it is is just a bunch of people standing around in bed sheets looking at window shade samples. Right? <laughs> and he said, oh, I know what you, you want something with some salt. I said, yeah. And he said, the assassination of opium. It's a picture, it'll, uh, it, uh, it's a picture of a lawyer having his throat cut. <laughs> right? Now this, this picture right here is called uh, Justinian and his lawyers, Trebonian and Theophilus. Um, the Roman uh, Empire had been reorganized under Diocletian and the emperor became the sole lawgiver. This, the, the Senate had been, uh, had, had been turned into a completely, totally honorific position. It had no lawgiving uh, powers, no, they, it had no power at all. The emperor was the sole lawgiver. Now this is the Emperor Justinian, the, a Christian emperor in Byzantium, when, when it became Constantinople. He is, the em, he is a Byzantine emperor, he's the emperor of the East. Uh, and this is in the seventh century. And now he was a barbarian also, he was an Illyrian. His father was a, a, a Emperor Justin, and he was illiterate, incidentally. He, when he signed documents, he signed it through uh, uh, a, um, what do you call that, a, um, a stencil. He couldn't read or write. And he was married to a strip teaser right, by the name of Theodora. She was the bear tamer's daughter. And it was, a, it was an interesting, there's a book called The Secret History, which is a, a, the story of Justinian and Theodora. And it really sounds like almost like modern politics today. Uh, I would recommend it to you. It's written by, I think, Procopius. Well, anyway, to make a long story longer, uh, this is Trebonian and Theophilus. They were the men that were hired to, to, to codify the law under Justinian. Now, Justinian, being an illiterate barbarian, sort of doesn't know what these two Greeks are yelling at each other about over some issue of involving the Roman law. And so he's got this look on his face that kind of doesn't exactly know what's going on, but he, he has the power, so he's hired these men to do it. Now, um, uh, this law, which is called the Codex Justinianus, 
eventually, in, uh, when, when Constantinople collapsed, a group of uh, Greek scholars moved to Bologna and uh, reestablished the Roman law in Italy. And as, as uh, the, the Roman law, the law, uh, because of the barbarian invasions, had become the Salic law, which is a barbaric law. But they reestablished the Roman law in Bologna in the, in the 15th century. And that's what the Napoleonic Code is based on, which is what the Louisiana Civil Law is based on, is the Napoleonic Code. So you see, all, I'm, I'm making a, a point here with this. I hope I'm not uh, 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 pushing it, but that's kind of why this, these pictures would be hanging in a show for the 200th anniversary of the state. Now, right over here is uh, a painting that I did. Um, it's called, uh, it's called um, uh, Xenophon of Kos, examining uh, the Emperor Claudius. As, uh, the gentleman in question, Xenophon, is being impersonated by a friend of mine who, was, who came to my studio one day, and um, Ali, Dr. Edmonds, Ali Edmonds, he said, uh, Karen sent me over to get my portrait painted. And I said, Ali, you don't want your portrait painted, do you? He said, well, she sent me here to get my portrait painted. I said, no, but I have an idea that you, sir, could be Xenophon of Kos, examining Lady Cla Claudius, a Roman, a Roman uh, physician. It'll be your portrait, but you'll be impersonating the Roman physician. He said, oh, gee, I, yeah, that's a good idea. He said, you know, that's my specialty, orthopedic surgery, polio, because, you know, uh, Claudius had polio, they think. And um, so I went and got the toga and dressed him up. That, you know, took his picture. But this represents a sort of a scene where the emperor, the emperor's being, his leg is being examined by uh, Xenophon of Kos. And over here I had, uh, is another one of my Roman pictures. Um, this is hanging in uh, my patron's dining room, and it represents a scene from, uh, from a, a book called The Satyricon. There was a movie made of it by Federico Fellini way back in the, I guess, the late, late 60s. And it, uh, in it, it depicts, this, it's a, uh, 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 it depicts a Roman banquet. And in the movie, uh, Trimalchio uh, is, uh, well, in the book, too, he's an, an ex-slave who's made a lot of money in real estate. And he, he uh, invites his friends every evening to uh, his villa, which is near Mount Vesuvius, um, uh, for, for banquet every evening. There's a, he has a very elaborate chainer that he throws for his friends. But the only penalty that you have to pay is you have to hear him declaim his poetry. Now, the book, uh, the Satyricon, is written by Petronius, uh, who was a courtier of the Emperor Nero. And some people think that the, the book, this particular feast, it's called the Feast of Trimalchio, is a parody of the Emperor Nero because Nero thought of himself as a, as a poet, as an artist. You know, when, when, he was, when he committed suicide, he said to his, the slave that was helping him do it, he says, what an artist the world is losing. <laughs> well, the thing is, the reason it, I, you know, it's in the show about the 200th anniversary of Louisiana is that we've, in a, in a way, have inherited the elaborateness of the Roman of the Roman feast. In the in the in the in the the uh, the Romans had a, uh, had a way of of uh, dramatizing uh, uh, food, and in this case the, the, is the, the depiction in the book the Satyricon of Trimalchio's feast. There's a wild boar that's brought into the banquet hall, and an orchestra strikes up a march as they bring in the 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 the, uh, the wild boar. And a man impersonating Hercules, um, um, is, and that's what this guy is right here, stabs a wild boar. Now, it's a cooked boar, right? He stabs it, and then thrushes fly out, right? Now, what that means is I mean, the Romans, the, like I say, the Romans like to dramatize their food, but I, I, I can rationalize it as being sort of here in Louisiana, because when you go to a, a restaurant, for instance, like Antoine's, and the waiter does a, does a flaming brulo. Well, what they're doing is dramatizing the food. That's uh, kind of our inheritance of that kind of, that kind of um, theatricality when it comes to eating in, uh, in, in uh, culture today. Now, my patron, this gentleman right here, and this is his family. They're, they're, they're watching the, the, the presentation of the wild boar, and I forget the name of the boar. Um, there's a, you know, the, in the, uh, the Acts of Hercules, uh, yeah, it's the, the Aramanthian boar. It was one of the, when Her Hercules slays the, the Aramanthian boar, it's one of the tasks that he's been assigned. Well, that's what he, they're reenacting the, at, the, at, the, at the feast. And here's, but here's the family right in here. This is the Laborde family. And I said, you know, unfortunately, Ted here 
is sort of obscured. You can't see his face. So I put his head right here at the end of the furniture. Can you see that? <laughs> see, that's my, my patron's portrait. He's a knob at the end of a, of a, of a um, what do they call that, a triclinium. Now, right this way, please. Next. Uh, this picture is called the uh, Triumph of Neptune. This is, uh, uh, it's also a commission by Mr. Laborde. Um, this represents the triumphal procession of uh, Titus and Vespasian. I got the idea from a book that was written by um, uh, a Jewish writer and general, uh, uh, Josephus, uh, who, who was employed by Vespasian to write an account of the Jewish war that Titus and Vespasian were, 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 were waging against Judea. And uh, uh, the, both of them attended a Roman triumphal procession. And in the uh, book by Josephus, uh, there is an actual description of the entire procession. And it's the only one that's come down from antiquity. And since it's an ancient document, it sort of has these um, uh, uh, gaps in them. And when he describes this procession, he describes it as um, what, it, what sounds like a, a carnival parade, <laughs> right? Because the triumphal, who is the man that, or the man in this case, the, the, the father and son, that would tended the triumphal procession for their victory uh, by the Senate, were um, uh, preceded the, the entire procession in a chariot. And there would usually be a slave standing in the back with a, with a crown over, over the triumphal's head and say, remember thou art only a man, remember thou art only a man. Because the, you know, the, the classical Greeks and Romans, they could experience these kind of uh, events, they would suddenly think of themselves as gods, right? Which is really why the Romans got in so much trouble with their emperors, because uh, power sort of corrupted totally. And uh, well, anyway, that's what, but that's what the, the, the triumph preceded the parade. Now then the, the, uh, Josephus describes the parade itself. And what it is, it's actually floats that are decorated wagons, which are uh, tableau roulant, which are decorated to represent the, each of the events in the Judaic war, the Judean war, uh, the battles, see? And on the floats, instead of, uh, where well, you hear the masked people throwing, you know, men throwing beads and stuff, were the prisoners themselves in golden chains. And, he just, and each float represented the battles that they were, that they were captives, uh, the, they were captured in. And so, but then the, 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 the the account ends with the words, and then came the ships, and then it it's out. Just, I mean, you don't exactly know what that meant, but what I thought was that what they wore were ships that were actually part of the naval battles that maybe were fought at that, in that war. So what you see here is one of the ships being presented, uh, being carried by in procession. Now what they're going past though, there's little references, it's like for instance, this, this edifice here is the Arch of Augustus, which is um, uh, erected by the Senate in honor of his victory, uh, naval victory, over the uh, fleet of Antony and Cleopatra at the Battle of, I think it's Actium, it was a naval battle. So, they, he, so it refers back to the, the, the naval imagery. And this is the marriage of, uh, I got this from a Roman sarcophagus, uh, the marriage of Amphitrite and Neptune, that's what this represents. And then the, I said, now have the, and then this is a, sort of an aquatic turtle fountain, right? Now this is a little esseter I put in. I don't, there's no evidence of it archaeologically, but I thought it would be really this, little, this formal device, this curving out of the picture plane. And of course, here's the band playing. There's a band playing. And this is the cult statue of Neptune. And they're going past the, temp, the temple of Julius Caesar right here. And this over here uh, would be the temple of Castor and Pollux. And I, this arch, I, actually, I reconstructed, there's a Roman coin. It's the only evidence. And this, is, this arch is, is not there anymore. It's be, it was destroyed at some point, it's gone. But the, there's, a, there's a visual evidence of it in a Roman coin, so I, I reconstructed that from, that, uh, from the Roman coin itself. So that's, uh, that's um, uh, and of course this is the, um, uh, the entrance to the Palatine Hill over here, and this is the Temple of Vesta, the House of the Vestal Virgins. It's all in one corner of the Roman Forum. So now what, now where do we go? Well, our own particular emperor here. This is, this is a, uh, a painting that I did. Um, I did this picture back in the, uh, 1985. It's the first trial of Governor Ed Edwin Edwards. That's what it represents. Uh, I was hired by uh, Vanity Fair magazine to do an illustration for my friend 
Nancy Lemon's article that she was writing about uh, the governor's trial. Now, the thing is, Nancy never did the article because she decided to turn it into a book, and the book is uh, called The Ritz of the Bayou, so the article became a book. Vanity Fair never used the picture, but they paid me to do it, and I had it, uh, and, uh, uh, and I sold it to a, a doctor in uh, Lake Charles. But what it represents is Governor Edwards walking through Lafayette Square with his attorneys, Camille Gravel and Jim Neal. And they're walking past the statue of Benjamin Franklin, which is still there, and, and it's, it says, save while you are young to spend while you are old. Or a penny saved is a penny earned, right? And of course, here's all the, the media at the time. Um, they were, you know, because uh, they're, they're walking over to the, civil, the uh, federal courts building where the trial was. And I was also uh, uh, the, the court artist for the Times Picayune. I did a lot of, uh, a lot of the drawings of the, of, of the trial, the first, I guess, maybe the first two weeks. And, um, Anyway, so I, I was really uh, well aware of the, of the, whole, of the whole sort of mise-en-scene of the trial. And anyway, to make a long story short, I saw Camille Gravel, it was coming out of the courthouse, and I said, Mr. Gravel, could you, Mr. Gravel, could you come please pose for me? I'm doing a picture of you and Edward Edwards. He said, oh, I'd love to, right? And he came over and I said, could you kind of look conspiratorial? So, you know, I didn't, I, he didn't pose in the sense that you know, I lingered into my, he didn't linger in my studio for hours. I took a picture of him. They said, you know, like this, go like that. He did. A fabulous uh, Louisiana type. Uh, he was, the, he was um, one of the defense attorneys. And this fellow over here was from Nashville, Jim Neal. And he was real good. You know, the first day I was in the trial, he came up, uh, he stood up and did his opening argument. And you could see the jury just went, uh, like this. And it kind of reminded me of what, why Cicero took acting lessons because he, you could see the jury was being swayed just by the guy's presence. The, it was, and, you know, and, and Edwards won that, that trial. He, he was, wasn't convicted. Um, but a, a, later on, uh, um, a friend of mine, it, well, during the trial, uh, was a friend of Edwards, a uh, politician. She said, yeah, maybe I should, could you think he'd be, he'd be, he went, we could show him the picture. I said, yeah, bring him over. So he came up to my attic at 604 Julia Street, and he looked at the picture and said, you made me too short. <laughs> I said, well, I said, it's artistic license, sir. I said, because I had to have a little bounce here, you know, kind of see a little curve like that. So, you know, you always, when you do a picture, you know, there are two ty there's, two, there's really two things you're dealing with. There's the form and the content. The form is what, what you see. It's the abstracted, it's the abstracted uh, image. It's how it works, uh, the nuts and bolts of the picture. Now, the content is the content. I mean, it's the story you're telling. Uh, but, uh, but I said, well, you know, that's you. You know, because everything, everything functions as, uh, as a, uh, has to function not just as the content, but also as the form. And, and the thing is, the irony of the whole thing is that I was told this by my, when I was in graduate school, there's always a way out. You know, you might have, might have, you have a problem with wetting the form and the content, but there's always, if you know what you're doing, if you know exactly, if you can distance yourself enough to where you see the thing as an abstraction, and, you, and you're willing to do it. Now, there's a lot of times you're not willing to do it because the mind just wants you to go to sleep and get sick of the, of the whole task. And the mind, the, your brain will say, please, stop torturing me. Stop, stop working at this thing. Go to sleep, go to sleep. Because uh, Salvador Dali talks about how, how uh, sleep is one of, the, one of the, da the dangers that an artist has to face because what happens is your, 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 your brain shifts to the beta phase, which is really the phase that right before you go to sleep. And he recommends, Salvador Dali, a very practical man, he says, when you feel sleepy, he says, make sure you have an easy chair in your studio. And then sit in the easy chair, and on one arm of the easy chair at the base, put a pie pan. And then take a, a, a soup spoon and put it between your index finger and your thumb. And when you start to fall asleep, you'll open, you'll relax your thumb and forefinger, and the, pan, and the spoon will hit the pan and wake you up. <laughs> so then you go back to work, right? Now, I don't quite do that, do it that way, but uh, anyway, that's, I'm, I'm just jaw-jawing about that. But um, anyway, but this is a pretty accurate depiction of that, of that space, too. There's uh, the old city hall in the background. And those are real, these were real cameramen that I, that I don't know where they are now. And this is, and this is somebody who had been passing by. So he's a passer, a, a passer. Uh, but that's a real portrait, too. I like to use real faces in my pictures because, uh, you know, there's a... There's more realism, there's more of a sense of psychology uh, at work. Because in a lot of ways, when, particularly when you're using figurative work, 
the expression of the eyes create a directional line that you don't even, that's not even there in the formal aspect of the painting. So that's kind of where the, that's where the content crosses over into into form. Like for instance, if you if you see a picture of a woman, uh, say uh, you know this fellow's looking at you, or you're, he's looking over here. Well, it's creating these 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 directional lines that are based upon your impression of the psychology. In other words, the thing isn't really even there. So there's a there's a sort of a uh, what would you call a psychic realm that uh, that uh, that narrative, uh, particularly narrative paintings, uh, explore? That maybe uh, an abstracted uh, an abstracted picture wouldn't really do that. You know, there's two types of paintings. It's a friend of mine tells me. He says there's the generic and then there's the associative. Now this is an associative picture because you're associating it with the trial of Governor Edwards. That's Governor Edwards. It's associated. This image is associated with him. It's associated with a particular time. Okay, a generic picture is a formal painting. In other words, my friend would say that the, it grows up out of the sheer fact of the rectangle. In other words, an abstracted picture, which is based on well, it's, in other words, a formal painting. It's the, the nuts and bolts of the picture. And I would counter though that the oldest painting on earth has just been discovered. And it was discovered in a cave in Spain. It's estimated it's about 35,000 years old. And it's a picture of a seal, right? It's a seal. So it's an associative picture. It's only, you know, what, what happens is in, in art, uh, it's like what Hume says about, uh, about um, the culture itself, that, we, that uh, uh, the longer you think about it, the more philosophical things become. And the more withdrawn it becomes from reality itself. And that the task of a philosopher is to, is, is to take that distance that he's created between him and reality and reintegrate it back into real life. So in a sense, to me, that's what figurative painting does. It takes the abstracted and brings it back into, into the sort of the drama of life itself, which is essentially a narrative phenomena, beginning, middle, and end. Birth, life, death, right? <laughs> That's kind of what, it, well, I'm jaw-jawing. Now this speaking, now that Yeats said, in speaking of what was the fit image, the fit, uh, the fit uh, subject of, um, of uh, poetry, which is art. He says, the only, the, only, the only fit subject for poetry and art is sex and death. Sex. Hence the, the, <laughs> hence the sign on the door, warning nudity, right? This is a commission I did for a friend of mine now, um, I had uh, been, con uh, uh, this is way back, uh, a friend of mine was saying, you know, George, you don't do any nudes. I said, well, you know, you're right. I, I mean, you do a lot of them in, in, in school, I mean, uh, 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 figure drawing, et cetera. Uh, I said, but I never, to, I was not really doing it as a, as, a, as a subject itself, in it for itself. I said, you know, you're right. I said, but you know, I'm a history painter, so my, my nudes have to be historical. I recommend to you like Lady Godiva, for instance, that's a famous theme in uh, particularly in 19th century art. Um, nude woman on a horse. Um, oh, you look at the Sistine Chapel, it's, in, you know, it's one enormous sea of ceiling of nothing but nudes, right? So they're, they're, this, is, this is the Western canon, essentially. Is the, uh, in fact, my doctor was, um, uh, he said, George, why do artists like to do the nude? I said, Doctor, if it wasn't for the rediscovery of the human body in the Renaissance by artists like Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael, there'd be no modern medicine today. So it's a sort of a, uh, it's, it's something that the West can claim for its own sake, uh, can, can claim for its, uh, the nude for its own sake in art, right? So anyway, I said, but you know, I'm a history painter, but I'm also a localist, I'm a local yokel. So my nudes have to be historical and local, right? So um, I had a friend, Al Rose, wrote a book called Storyville, and it was about the red light district in New Orleans. And, uh, it, and he describes all the different acts that uh, were done in the, by, the, by the, the, um, the prostitutes in the, in the district. And one of them was a dance called the Oyster Dance. Now, this painting was commissioned for a, a, a friend of mine's dining room. And I said, ah, a food scene, right? A dining room, like the, the Feast of Trimalchio, right? And my friend said, yeah, and see, but I want one of those Storyville pictures. I said, I got the perfect uh, thing, the oyster dance. Al talks about the oyster dance as one of the prostitutes would take her clothes off, dance with a, uh, a tray of oysters. She would take the oyster and uh, take it and put it on her forehead and then shimmy it down her body and kick it up in the air and catch it in her mouth. 
uh, a dozen oysters. So I said, that's your food theme, and then that's the story sort of together, right? So that's what this represents. And of course, here's the, here's the uh, professor on the piano playing the music to accompany, us, accompany her dancing. And there's another explanation that was given to me a lot later, but, but uh, it's, it's too obscene to put on, <laughs> on videotape, so we won't go into it. Now this picture right here, this painting, uh, is another one of my storyable pictures, and I got the idea from doing, uh, from reading in Al's book, he, had, he illustrates an ad that was in the old directory for the Red Light District, and it says, Antonia Gonzalez, world's foremost female cornetist, and it gives her a dress, and there's a little blurb, it says, Miss Gonzalez, is a very talented musician, and she could have had a life on the stage had it not been for the many friends that she made in her present profession. And so I started uh, thinking about it, and I said, uh, well, all right, this friend of mine calls me up, he's an attorney, and uh, he says, I'd like you to do a, a painting for my office. And I said, I got a great idea, Cicero defending Caecina, I've been working on you know, the idea of the Roman civil. He said, no, George. He said, I want one of those pictures you've been doing about the red light district in New Orleans. I said, for your office? He said, yeah. And so this actually hung in my friend's office, in his office. <laughs> and people would come in, and there was this fat lady playing a trumpet, right? Uh, he got a big kick out of it. It's now in their house. He, uh, uh, he put it in his house. But um, this is uh, so what my idea of what Ms. Un Ms. Gonzalez would have been doing. She would be entertaining people with a trumpet playing. I guess that's what she was doing, unless trumpet playing was something else. It was a something else that meant something else, you know, when it was a double entendre. But anyway, that's what that is. Okay, now. Now, oh wait, look, see, this is the drawing that I did for, for the painting. Uh, the, when I do, when I work, I work in the, what they, it was, I don't, it was called the, the academic method, the French academic way you, method, where you, in order to do the picture, you have a, you have a, um, uh, you, build your, you build your way through, you sort of create an avenue to the painting. You have a conceptual phase and an executive phase. The painting is the executive phase. The drawing represents a more conceptual phase where, uh, uh, now I've actually, I'm gonna explain it even further with the, the, this picture, but this is a drawing that I did for that painting. And um, uh, it has everything that I'm gonna put in the painting except the color. But what this does is it gives, it gives the, you see I'm doing this as a, um, a commission. So what these studies that you would do in the drawing, the final drawing, gives your client an inkling of where you're going with the picture. It's like how an architect would work. An architect just doesn't design the house and then present it to the client. The client gets to see it in, its fa in, the, in the different creative phase, the phases that, it's, that the design uh, schedule is going through. So that's what this does. It does two things. It, shows my client where I'm going with the picture. And let me tell you something, it's easier to erase lead paint, you know, uh, graphite, than it is to erase oil paint, right? They say, oh, there's something wrong with the mouth, right? Particularly, you know, people are just concerned about their portraits and that's, because that, that's what Sargent said, he said, oh, portraiture consists of there being something wrong with the mouth, <laughs> right? <laughs> so anyway, uh, but this presents, this presents the, the, um, the, uh, the picture to them before you do the picture. Uh, and it, like I said, it, it, it makes them feel better about where, what, what they're spending their money on. But there's a, it, there's a third factor that gets involved in it. It entertains them. Uh, it's, um, it, they enjoy it. And that's important because, you know, it's all entertainment. It's, it's theatrical. It's um, but the way, at least well, the way I'm doing it. I'm not, I, what you see is what you get. You're getting a painting of Governor Edwards and the, the news uh, and his lawyers. That's what that is. It's no more than that. It's no more than that. It's, uh, there's no metaphysic involved, right? I, I have no ideology, none whatsoever. The only ideology I, I subscribe to is the first book to be written in the modern age on pain. It was written by, um, by uh, um, uh, Alberti, Leon Alberti, great, you know, the, the great uh, Renaissance scholar, Florentine. He said, painting exists in order that the dead should live again and the distant brought near. Now here is what I'm talking, what he's talking about essentially. Now he's, it could be anything, I mean it doesn't have to be Roman, but it, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, it's the er definition of painting. Now after that it takes off and becomes, it becomes a lot of other things too, but being a reactionary, I'm a, what you call a romantic reactionary, I look backwards, that's more than enough for me. The dead living again and the distant brought near. Now in this case, this is literally sex over here, the, the, uh, the uh, oyster dance, and death. 
This picture I did particularly, specifically for the show. I wanted to bring uh, the history of Louisiana closer into the 20th century. And this represents the crime scene after the sh shooting of Huey Long. When I was a kid, I took a, a, a government class in high school, and I had a very good teacher, uh, a man named uh, Alvin Murphy. And uh, he said, we've got you, I want everyone in the, you know, we're gonna do a project, an end project, a, th a theme, a uh, term paper, or exhibition uh, of uh, some government subject. And so I went to him, I said, Mr. Murphy, instead of doing a, a instead of doing a, a paper or a model of the bicameral legislative system, could I do a painting? I said, well, he said, we're painting. I said, yeah, I'll do a painting of a of government subject. He said, what's that? I said, I'll do a picture of the assassination of Huey Long. And he said, yeah, go ahead. And I did, right? <laughs> And he gave me a 95. It was, it was, he made me into an artist, just, you know. Kind of interesting, because uh, art is an uh, odd sort of thing. It's, a, it's an escape, and yet it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a destination to it. It's a destiny. In the case of Mr. I was escaping having to write a term paper. It got me out of writing a term paper, and that taught me a lot, taught me a big lesson. But anyway, to make a long story longer, uh, there's a painting by John McCready, which is an excellent painting, uh, 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 it's called The Assassination of Huey Long, and it depicts this, the shooting of, of Long. So I said, I don't want to reproduce that. Uh, so I'll do the aftermath, an image of the aftermath. Uh, and um, I found a photograph, the only uh, evidence of this event, besides the, the hallway itself, which is, you know, it's a, a shrine, um, is a photograph that the coroner took of Dr. Weiss, to, so they could identify him. And I said, that's the that's it, that's what I'm gonna paint. Because I've done a series of pictures, and I'll show you, of, of artist and model, artist and model, uh, artist and subject. So this is, in a sense, the, you know, the artist and the subject. There's the, the coroner photographing the body. And he's discussing the issue with his assistant, Miss Margie here, right? And this, uh, this, is to this is just conjecture as to what it would have looked like, except for the body of Dr. Weiss, you see right here. This is where he was. This is where he lay next to this column right here. And, um, but anyway, uh, I was talking about my methods, but this gives you an idea of the methods that, I'm, that I use. See, here's the, the, the first, this is the drawing. Then here's the color study, and here's the final, the final picture. Now, when I did the drawing, this color study is based upon a, a, a previous uncorrected drawing. When I got to the level of the color study, you see the whole, the ball is always moving. It, it, you don't just do it and then do it and do it. It all, it goes back and forth, back and forth. Uh, I said, you know, that really that lamp that's in the hallway, that needs to be in the picture. For one thing, because it creates more of a circular, circular pattern like this, uh, the formal aspect. But also, that lamp really signifies that era. This is what, 1935, and that's that kind of Art Deco lamp uh, that is, that, that signifies what that per period looked like. So I said, well, I went back in, back to the drawing, and I redrew it, and I put the lamp in. So that's why there's no lamp in the, in the color study. But if you notice, the color study is pretty damn close to the, to the, to the painting. So uh, uh, you, you just, there's no, you know, there's a, there's a great deal of, uh, of um, improvisation. There's improvisation, but it's based upon the uh, the improvisation is based upon what you discover in doing the thing itself. You're not just sort of improvising for the sake of it. You're, you're, it's, fu it's a functional impro improvisation because you've done these studies. And so this, this is sort of a, a, an example of, of what my methods would be. Now, uh, this, there might be, a, uh, there's usually a, a, an earlier, more conceptual drawing. It's a little doodle. And like I recommend to you Rembrandt's uh, uh, drawings, those little sketches that he makes. Uh, that you've, you've seen in, you know, in books uh, of the drawings of Rembrandt, he would do these little quick, quick gestural drawings. And if you look at them and you look at the final picture, everything that's in the gesture drawing, the small little drawing, is in the major picture, is in the executive phase, except it's, the executive phase is more detail, is more, it's, more, it's more weighty. But the, the, draw, the little sketch, that's it, there's everything in it that, that, that you would want. And so, you know, it's a, um, it's a, it's a process like I said, like an architect would work. And I studied architecture for four years and, uh, uh, at Tulane. It was like a monastery. I mean, it was well, finally when I got the art department, I said, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, this is a pip compared to that, that, 
that, that prison I was in at, at, for four years. But I learned how to do, you know, I learned how to do perspective. I learned how to do, in fact, my teacher, when uh, Milton Sherman came in my, my studio and he said, I'm glad to see my lessons paid off, huh? <laughs> I said, you bet they did. I said, because all my pictures are, have a, a horizon line, there's a van they're vanishing points, you know, and, the, and like I say, it's a, I build a picture like you would build a house in that respect, and like you would design a building. Now this picture right here, I have done, and we'll get back to the front, the big one here. Uh, I did a series of paintings that are based on uh, the letters that Edgar Degas wrote to, uh, when he visited uh, uh, New Orleans uh, in 1872-73, came here for a four month visit uh, his mother was from here, and his um, uncle, Michel Mousson, lived on Esplanade Avenue, and he stayed with them. Uh, the, the house is still there. Uh, it's been divided in half, but there's now a little, really neat little museum I went to a couple of, couple of weeks ago that they have. And um, anyway, to make a long story short uh, or longer, um, uh, I had, uh, was, and my friend Nancy called me up one day. She was up in New York. She said, Holiday Magazine, uh, uh, what is it called, American Heritage Magazine wants me to write an article about uh, Degas visit to New Orleans uh, vis-a-vis -vis the, the painting he did in uh, his, the major work at the time uh, was called Portraits in a Cotton Office and it's an interior uh, scene of his uncle's cotton business on uh, Perdido and Carondelet Street and uh, they, they're running a picture of that uh, painting and, and an issue they're doing on American journalism I can't do it. Could you do it? Could you read the Picayune for four months at the time that Degas was here? See? So I said, yeah, it's a great idea, and they'll pay me, right? So I went down to the, uh, the, the uh, newspaper, I think it was either the historic collection or the um, historic collection of the, of the library, I forget which, and I read the Picayune from December of 1872 when he got here, late, uh, early winter, all the way through March. And I wrote a little article about what he was, what, uh, what was going on, because his, his brother is depicted in the painting reading the Picayune, right? Well, it's an it was an interesting experience because um, uh, uh, I had uh, the letters, I also had the letters uh, of Edgar Degas, I had a little book by um, Edward Marcel Guerin of uh, the letters of Edgar Degas. The first several letters in the book are written from New Orleans, so what I did was to, contrast what Degas said in his letters about an event and what the Picayune said about the event, right? And sometimes they're kind of mutually exclusive, but it was this, you know, I sort of did that compare and contrast kind of thing, you know? Well, anyway, I said, you know, this, is, this experience is too, more, it's too good to, 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 to uh, ignore. I said, maybe I should turn them into paintings. Well, what, there was one thing, though, that I, I was, didn't know this at the time, but I was doing some really good art, uh, architectural, I mean, excuse me, art history research because I found out why his brother is reading the Picayune in that painting. In 1873, there's an article in the Picayune that describes, um, there, was very, there was political chaos in, in Louisiana at the time. Michel Mousson was a member of the Fusion Democratic Ticket he wasn't on the ticket, but he was one of the people that was heavily involved in the politics of the time. And they were running Beauregard and all these reform candidates. And they needed, an, uh, they needed a newspaper to act as their uh, um, you know, propaganda sheet. But so guess what? In the Picayune, it lists, he said, the Picayune has been bought by this group of businessmen. And it lists the businessmen. And one of the businessmen that owns the Picayune at that time has just bought it is the firm of, uh, of um, Mousson, Prestige, and Liverday, which is his uncle's cotton factor's office, right? That's why he's reading the Picayune, his brother's reading the Picayune in the picture, is because his uncle owns it at the time. So it's a sort of a pay-in to, to his family's success in New Orleans, plus the fact that the cotton exchange had just been organized, and his brother, Rene, was on the statistics committee. And the cotton statistics were reported in the Picayune. That was the, the organ that they used to report the cotton statistics. So what he's looking at in the Picayune is the cotton statistics, you see. So, uh, and that's art history. That's not art. But uh, I was very pleased with that. Well, anyway, it inspired me. The whole, the whole experience inspired me to do a series of pictures about Degas' visit to New Orleans. 
uh, the, the, well, well, we'll get to the, the, ma the major work. But this picture right here, there's a photograph of Edgar Degas that was made, they think, in New Orleans. It was in the frontispiece of a catalog uh, of, of a Degas show back, and that was given to the New Orleans Museum of Art back in the early 60s. And he's posed against a backdrop, right? Now, okay, a cotton backdrop, like a canvas backdrop, is a very informal picture. Well, when I was, um, how can I, uh, uh, the phone rang. There was a friend of mine from the Historic New Orleans Collection, Dodie Plateau. She says, George, you've got to come see these drawings. The collection is just bought by Alfred Wode. I said, I'd love to come see them. And the beautifully drawn imagery of the city of New Orleans that was done for Harper's Weekly would be turned into, um, into woodcuts to illustrate New Orleans under reconstruction in Harper's Weekly. And Wode was, a, uh, was, was called, well, he was a really great uh, draftsman. And uh, he, uh, he, he did, uh, you've seen Wode's work, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the Civil War, because he did a lot of stuff for Harper's Week about the battles and stuff. Well, anyway, he was in New Orleans, almost the same time as Edgar Degas, right? And now Degas, in his letters, he says, there's a lot of things I'd love to paint here. The, the, uh, the, uh, the, the ships at the end of the, with the big black smokestacks, meaning the steamboats at the end of the, of the Grand Boulevard, meaning Canal Street. He'd like to be drawing scenes on the levee. But he can't because his eyesight's deteriorating. He had macular degeneration. So he just mainly did scenes, you know, genre scenes. He didn't do outdoor stuff. Well, I go down and look at the, at the, the collections, collections of Wode's drawings. And what should I see but a picture that Wode did. Of a, it's called German Itinerant Photographer on New Orleans Levee. And I look at it. And then there are other pictures that he did on the New Orleans levee. I said, well, this guy's doing the, the, the very drawings that Degas would have done if Degas' eyesight was better. Plus the fact that it explains that photograph. And I said, that's where he had that photograph taken. It was taken on the levee by that German itinerant photographer that Woe drew. So what I did, this is a painting of Degas having his photograph taken, that photograph I'm talking about, on the levee. And what I did was to use all of Woad's drawings of the characters that he did on the levee. So here's Wode, see, I put Wode here. Here's Wode doing his drawings of the, of the levee, right? And these are all, the whole, the whole picture is based on, on Wode's drawings. So, uh, you know, it's like what Picasso said. He said, good artists steal, bad artists copy. <laughs> so anyway, that's a, the, this, was a, this was actually gonna be a, uh, it was, I was in a contest uh, where they were gonna do a, a uh, for the aquarium in New Orleans, they wanted artists to submit ideas for a big painting in the, in the aquarium. And I said, who wants to paint fish? Good Lord, what I'll do is paint the levee. I'll do a picture of the levee, of a, a, cultural, a major cultural event happening on the levee. Degas having his photograph taken, probably in the same exact spot where the aquarium is today. Say it's the end of Canal Street. So, but they, they, they bought the drawing, but they didn't buy the, the idea, so well, they got fish instead, you know. Now this is another, this is another picture I did, I mean, you know, the coroner photographing Dr. Weiss. Uh, the other picture, Degas, which we're going to see, Degas painting portraits of the Count of. Well, this is, this, is, um, a, this is a commission from a, a man who's gone now, Dr. James Nelson. He co mainly collected imagery of the French Quarter. And he said, would you do a picture of the French Quarter for me? And I said, well, you know, I've never really done one. I've never, you know, that was always, said, it's just been done. It's been done by William Woodward, the best paintings of the French Quarter you'll ever see. And they were done in 1900, 19 to 1910. And um, uh, I said, but I got a great idea, doctor. See, Dr. Nelson collected the works of uh, William Woodward. They're now in the, um, they're now in the historic collection. Uh, but uh, he uh, bought them from, uh, uh, from Woodward's son. And I said, I've got a great idea, Dr. Nelson. I'll do a picture of William Woodward painting one of his pictures in the French Quarter. So it's an artist model sort of, sort of scene. So here you've got uh, uh, Woodward uh, painting at the corner of, um, uh, of uh, Wilkinson and Charter Street. And what I've done is take the painting that he did. It's a painting that he did of the, of, of the Renaissance, the like Restaurant de la Renaissance, which is now the Alpine, or used to be the Alpine. I think it still is. Um, but I took all the characters in that painting and realigned re them in the painting. See, there's a woman sweeping the sidewalk. So here she is. She's come over to look at, at William Woodward painting his picture. There's a Creole milk wagon in the painting. So he's driving past, going down Wilkinson Street. And there, of course, there's the restaurant. And there's a street cleaner so in the painting. So I put him over here. And here, you know, Will, uh, Woodward uh, created, he and his brother Ellsworth created the Newcomb Art Department. 
and the Tulane School of Architecture, the Department of Architecture at the time. So here I have him telling these people how he's doing the picture. In other words, he's acting in his role not as just as an artist, but as a teacher, you see. So that's, uh, that's that. And over here, we're getting into the Battle of New Orleans. We'll start with this picture right here. This is the first one. This picture started out as a, a project for a, a public building in New Orleans. It never came about, but I did a drawing of it. And I had that drawing around. I had the drawing for years. I still have the drawing. And um, uh, so finally, I said, you know, Schmidt, uh, you're not getting any younger. Maybe it's about time you should do, you do this picture. Now, I have a studio. It's a very small studio, but I have a gallery. So I painted this in the gallery. It was kind of like, like uh, uh, you know, people would come in, actually could come in and see me paint the picture. But um, this is the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, years ago, uh, uh, there was a movie called The Buccaneer. And um, uh, it was made by Cecil B. DeMille, produced by Cecil B. DeMille. It was uh, directed by Anthony Quinn. And the premiere was here, it was in New Orleans. It's about 1958. And, you know, when you're a kid, uh, we have blood, kids are bloodthirsty little creatures. I was obsessed with the Battle of New Orleans. And here was a movie that depicted the Battle of New Orleans, Yul Brenner's Lafitte, and uh, Charles Boyer as Dominic Yu. Well, my mother took me to the premiere, it was at the Sanger Theater, and guess whose hand I shook? Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> he was there, right? My favorite movie director of all time. Romans, you know, all, the greatest show on earth. And finally, here was this picture. Uh, the Buccaneer, and it depicts the Battle of New Orleans. Well, anyway, I, you know, there's a Cis I was actually taller than Cecil B. DeMille. If there's any influence on my career as an artist, it's Cecil B. DeMille. I mean, that's what this is. It's really, you know, that kind of storytelling, historical storytelling. Anyway, so um, I said, someday I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to do a painting of the Battle of New Orleans. And um, so I, th this is the end result. Now, this painting is probably the most accurate picture painted of the battle. This actually shows the whole 15-minute climactic of the battle, which only lasted two hours. So what it depicts is General Gibbs's regiment charging the, uh, the uh, uh, charging Lieutenant Spot's battery. But it also depicts the death of Pakenham and the Highlanders uh, uh, obliquing across the field with the G General Jackson's headquarters, which was the, the McCarty house, and his line headquarters, which is the uh, Rodriguez House. And uh, this, of course, is the, is the, um, the, uh, the Rodriguez Canal. And uh, uh, this was one of the salients uh, uh, when, when, the, the, when in 1803, when Jefferson bought Louisiana, he sent a military con uh, commission down here to determine the de defensive salience of the city of New Orleans. And they actually decided that one of the salients was the Rodriguez Canal. This was not improvised by Jackson. He already knew that this is where they were going to draw the defense, was at the Rodriguez Canal. So that's what the, and, he, and he had it flooded because it ran out to the river and he flooded it. And the British had to cross a freshly, a freshly plowed um, uh, sugarcane field. The burn, this is the burning of the Chalmette Plantation. They didn't, the Br Americans didn't want the British using this as a redoubt. And uh, anyway, a friend of mine, Tim Pickles, who's written a book about this, New Orleans, 1815, was my advisor as to the accuracy of the picture. And one day, I'm working on the, I'm working on the picture, and I'm working on it over here. He comes in, he says, I just finished this. I had just finished it. He said, the hats are wrong. <laughs> right? So I said, oh my God. So I had to change all the hats, right? He actually gave me a model, because he does, he does uh, reenactment costumes and stuff. And so he gave me a hat. But, I mean, you have to because, you know, to, in a history painting, you don't want somebody to come along and say, that's wrong. I mean, people like him, he'll come in and say, it's wrong. So it has to, it has to at least look right, right? Now, uh, these two pictures on either side are sort of like the result of my doing uh, this particular period. Now, this picture, this picture is kind of like Dr. Nelson uh, asking me to do a picture of the French Quarter. This friend of mine, who's a French Quarter, a uh, real tend to a lot of work in the French Quarter, uh, he said, could you do a picture of the French Quarter? I said, listen, I'll I go one better. I said, why don't we do a reconstruction of a particular site in the French Quarter? And, um, uh, but not the French Quarter that you would see today, which is essentially, you know, uh, 1870s. Uh, uh, the, 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 the mo ma most of the buildings in uh, the Quarter now are actually built after the 1870s. 
well, let's do an earlier version of the French Quarter and we could have something happening in the, in the street at the time. He said, what would you do? I said, I, uh, I would do uh, Lafitte the Pirate meeting General Jackson at the corner of, of uh, Royal and uh, Hospital Street, which is now Governor Nichols. Now, Tim, we were talking in, in, during the Battle of North, he said, uh, you know, there's this controversy about who, when, when Lafitte actually met Jackson. You know, like in the movie, uh, Jackson's played by uh, Charlton Heston and Lafitte the Pirate is Mule Brenner. And uh, they meet, meet in some kind of office room and, you know, the, the Lafitte's got his guns out and he says, don't move, Jackson. He said, oh, and then Jackson says, Mr. Peavy, you can, don't shoot him now. I said, just something, he's talking to somebody behind. He said, I know that old trick, Jackson. And then Mr. Peavy says, hey, Andy, I've got my medicine for you. Well, it's, you know, C.B. DeMille. Well, uh, the, uh, Tim said, oh, you know, uh, they did meet. And you know where they met? I said, where? He said, it was out in the street. It was at the corner of, uh, of uh, Charters and, and Hospital. Now, the reason they met there was because that was the gate, the military hospital, and the uh, barracks where Jackson was staying. And so you know, in the explanation, I said, oh, you know, then we could re I could reconstruct the, that what it would have looked like. Your back is to the gate, for instance, and you're looking towards the corner. Now, the thing is, you know, when um, now I have a picture that we're going to show, it's one of the, uh, behind you. Um, when the British came into uh, the Gulf, the first person they talked to were the pirates Lafitte. And Jean Lafitte invited these three military people into, their, into his house for breakfast. And they were very impressed that this pirate would, have such a, would be, be such a gentleman and have such a, an elaborate breakfast thrown for him, et cetera, and so forth. And they reported this back, et cetera. Well, what happened was they, they were offering Lafitte uh, three propositions. One would be $25,000 or a captaincy in the British Navy, or they'd blow him out the water, which goes to what the Americans did the Coast Guard did that. They did that later. And uh, so Lafitte said, oh, I'll think about it. Well, the thing is, he eventually, his model enemy was the governor of Louisiana, Claiborne. There's a, there was a reward out for the, both Pierre and Jean Lafitte, but they could never bring them in. Judge Hall, who was a magistrate, the, 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 the federal attorney, like, uh, uh, like Latin would be today, explained to Governor Claiborne, he says, you don't realize if I arrest Lafitte and his brother, I'll have to arrest everybody in New Orleans because <laughs> they're all in on the deal. See, they were smugglers, right? Well, anyway, Lafitte reports to, uh, to Claiborne that the British are here. Now, in those days, we're so used to things, the satellites. Uh, in those days, nobody knew where anybody was. There were no accurate maps or anything. And uh, so uh, Claiborne swallows his pride and introduced Lafitte to Jackson. Well, that's where he introduced him, was at that corner, because uh, it was early in the morning, and um, uh, Jackson was coming out with his dragoons, and there was Claiborne with Lafitte, and says, oh, General, I'd like you to meet someone. So the General gets off of his horse, goes over to Lafitte, and they shake hands. I'd like you to meet the pirate Lafitte, right? And so uh, Lafitte shakes hands with Jackson, and Lafitte gives him the Masonic handshake, which meant to Jackson that it was somebody he could deal with because they were both Freemasons. That was something that was a big deal, that, that little handshake. And it's a, we you take your thumb and you your four, your, one of your fingers and press it against the other guy's thumb or something like that. But that's what the, and he gave me that Masonic handshake. But what this does is, this is a reconstruction. None of these buildings are there now, because they, mainly this whole area was re, redone in the 1830s. But see here the dragoons, and uh, uh, there's Lafitte shaking hands with Jackson. This is my patron right here, I put him in the painting, and this is, my pay, uh, my, his wife and daughter, they're standing on the porch. I, this is, th these buildings, see this, is, this represents a type of building that was had the, uh, like uh, the Absinthe House is, where you've got a, a, third, a second floor that's actually a warehouse that's between the, the first floor and the, and, the, and, the, and the living quarters, you see? And this is one of the houses that you would have seen in the French Quarter in the 18th century, which was more of a West Indian type of a galleried house like the um, Madame John's Legacy on Dumaine Street. So that's kind of what I've done there. Now, this other picture here, this predates the meeting of, of J Jackson and Lafitte, but this is Lafitte's, this is called Jean Lafitte having breakfast with the British before, this is before the Battle of New Orleans, the British came into the Gulf. This was uh, a commission work, all these are, uh, except for the, the, well, the Battle of New Orleans is in a way too. Um, uh, this, these Friends of mine own a house down in Barrett Tarrant. It's an old Spanish house. It dates back to 1785. 
They said, could you do something with that house? I said, yes, I know exactly what we'll use the interior of the house as Lafitte's dining room, right, where he's entertaining the British at breakfast. And this, you know, this is a description, a visual description of what that breakfast would have looked like. Now, my friend said, we're talking about, now this is an interesting thing. You know, I use the real people. Uh, my friend, this is my patron right here, is impersonating one of the British, see? And he, uh, he says, uh, can you put my dogs in it? I said, sure, what kind of dogs do you have? He said, poodles. I said, who said Lafitte didn't have poodles? I said, here, show me the document that said he doesn't have poodles, right? Well, here are the poodles. Now, the thing is, we did a little, did a little research, and guess what? Napoleon had poodles. In fact, it was Napoleon that po popularized poodles. This is the same era. This is the Napoleonic era. You know, this is right before Waterloo, practically. Well, the, the Waterloo would happen in the, in, the, in the spring of 1815, the summer of 1815. But here, it's okay. So, you know, and then but here's his beautiful wife, Erin. She's holding a water pitcher. These are the kids. See, they're like waiters. And uh, he said, could you put my mother-in-law on it? I said, well, man. I said, well, ah, yes, she could be a Goya. She's a portrait hanging on the wall right here, you see? And then he says, see, there's, I've dovetailed two events. When the British left Lafitte's breakfast, they went out and the men, the, the, the other pirate captains, hated the British. So they threw them in jail. There was a little thing what they call a calaboose. And there was a, you know, a jail. And they put him in the jail and Lafitte came out and he says, this is no way to, to treat my friends, release them. He was showing the British who was in charge, so they released him. So I said, well, I'll put some pirates in there. And my friend said, could you make my, all my attorney friends pirates? These are very prominent attorneys in New Orleans, right? As the pro now, I put myself in it, too. I needed one last little bit of pia pia right here, so I put myself right, right, right here in front of the, the Goya, right? But that's how these pictures are painted. And uh, you know, it's an old way of doing it. Um, but, uh, and you need models, you know, you need, to, you need faces. And I learned this lesson a long time ago. I, I, I was with some friends in Florence at the Uffizi, and you got this fill of, of re early Renaissance paintings mainly, you know, uh, uh, Botticelli, for instance. And we went to a restaurant after going to the Uffizi. We sat in the restaurant for lunch, and the, um, the, the, the cook puts his head out the cook hole, you know, is to give the, the, dish, the dish to the waiter. And he looks like a Botticelli. He looks like somebody in the painting, right? But they, you know, what they would do, they'd say, hey, you, look like a, you, look, you kind of look like Jesus. Would you be in my picture of the Last Supper? Oh, yeah, sure, okay. Well, that's what they do. That's how they would do it. And I said, how immediate. It's, you know, modern art, it's like the, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the modern art is where the artist bends over backwards and kisses his own behind, if you know what I'm getting at, instead of doing something directly. Like, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dilaquan, in his journal, he says, I've just, I've just read Hamlet. I was so inspired that the next day I started working busily on lithographs illustrating Hamlet. And I thought, how, how, how direct, how direct to actually just go ahead and do it, not worry about whether it's modern or not, or whether it works within the sort of flimmel flam of the flimelzine. You know what I'm getting at? Well, anyway, now with the last picture I'm going to show you is uh, another one of my pictures of artists and models. And this in, uh, is based on that research that I did for American Heritage. Uh, magazine about, you know, Degas' visit. And his, his major work that he did here was of his uncle's law, uh, his uncle's um, cotton business, which is, the building is still there. It's called Factors Row. And it's right on the corner. The Factors Row is now being redone. And, uh, but it was a row of offices that were built um, uh, antebellum that actually I found out recently that General Butler had, uh, had his office in Factors Row. Well, so did uh, Michel Mousson, Michel uh, uh, Mousson Prestige and Livide. And that's what his uh, brother, uh, his, uh, uh, his uh, nephew, Edgar, is, did a painting. This is the first painting that De uh, Edgar Degas sold to a museum. It's in the Musée de Pau. I've actually seen it there. It was, they brought it back here for the last Degas show that they had a few years ago. And what this depicts is Degas' studio. He writes a letter to James Tissot. Uh, he says, I'm working on a painting called Portraits in a, cotton in a Cotton Office under the worst possible conditions. Well, his house was filled with 17 people. It was several, two families, his uncle, his, his cousin Estelle, his brother's, um, uh, his brother's married, his first cousin Estelle. And so there are kids around, and he's working in the guest room. And uh, so, uh, but in, the, in this case, uh, uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, there's the bed, the gasolier, and the whole works. Um, this is actually based on a photograph I, I found of an interior of a building uh, of a house on Esplanade Avenue of that period, so it kind of reflects that. 
And like this friend, here, this is a, another example. I, I have a photograph of Michel Mousson. I mean, I don't have it, but it's collected here. Uh, daguerreotype of Mousson. And a friend of mine said, I said, you know, I'm looking, like, I, that's not the look I wanted. He, and this friend of mine said, well, he looks like Dick Allen. Now, Dick Allen at times, dead, Dick's gone now. But Dick Allen was the head of the jazz arc. I was an old friend. And I said, Dick, could you pull, you look just like Michel Mousson. He said, oh, I do? I said, yeah, could you come, you know, put a, tap, a top hat on him? And he posed for me. So that's kind of where I get, and this is my friend, um, this is Stephen Sontheimer from the back. And my friend John Kraft, I used him as Rene. And this is um, Anne Massaw. She was at the, uh, uh, at the, um, at that time, was at the Gallia House on Royal Street. And she had a pair of dark glasses. They actually had an exhibit. I said, could you put those on and I can, you could be the blind Estelle. So that's what that represents, is Degas painting. She's my favorite artist, Edgar Degas. Wonderful painter, wonderful character, and, uh, and a New Orleanian. In fact, when he showed this painting in the first Impressionist exhibition, they called him, it was Edgar Degas, the Louisianian. <laughs> they didn't know he was from Paris. They thought he was from Louisiana. So, how do you like that? Plus ça change, plus que la même chose. <laughs>